Bible reading is from Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, and through to chapter 4, verse 11, and that's on page 1236 in the Pew Bibles. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Returning back to Revelation and this time to chapter 5, which is on page 1237. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people (coughs) and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God 
and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Can I encourage you to take a, a pew Bible and uh, turn with me to page 1,236, please, 1,236, so that you have Revelation chapter 4 uh, and 5 open in front of you tonight. And as you're doing that, let me pray for us as we come uh, to consider the glory of God alone. Let's pray. Father God, John the Baptist could say of himself, he must become less and Christ must become greater. Lord, tonight we pray that we would have a greater grasp, a realization, an understanding of who you are and what you've done in time and eternity for your creation and for your redeemed people so that our hearts and our lives would live and exist for your glory alone. Father, lift our eyes to God today, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever had those moments in your life when either Monday morning or Friday night after work, you think to yourself, what's the point of it all? Or maybe you're at home with children and the house is getting on top of you, the children are a nightmare, and you think to yourself, is this working? What's going on here? What's it all for? Or maybe something knocks you for six and you say to yourself, what's the point of it all? What's my work for? What is the point of living this way? And if I went around the room tonight, I'm sure you have those moments in your life where to varying degrees you would have different answers, different responses to the point of your life, to the point of your work, to the point of your family life. And if I were to ask Alan tonight, you know, what's the point of your life, Alan? You see, Alan would tell us clearly what it is. He's a graduate from Cambridge University. He's been eight years out from college and is working with an IT firm. Get this, though. He lives in New York but he has an apartment in Japan and California, which work provides for him, imagine that, so he doesn't have to live in hotels uh, during the week. Alan is in a relationship with Anna, and they have been living together for two years. Alan and Anna enjoy their precious and few weekends together, going out to top-end restaurants with friends, and during their holidays, they've been to numerous holiday destinations, such as Cancun in Mexico or the Maldives. You can see it, can't you? Alan is a gifted individual, driven and very ambitious. He knows what he wants to achieve in life. By 40, a partner in the company. He probably will get married at some point, but not too soon. He'd like to have children, but later, of course. And for Alan, at this moment in time, his life is his work, earning the money, the reputation, enjoying the benefits of a successful life and enjoying the pleasures to the max. And all this is done because he's skilled, because he's intelligent and the future looks good for him. So the question, what is your life for, Alan? It's very clear for him. This is what I'm aiming for, this is what I'm doing. He knows what he's about, where he's going, and the reality is that it centers on him and around his competency. Or take Craig, he's in the same IT firm as Alan. He does the same hours, enjoys the same work benefits, has the same means as Alan, and even has the same ambitions. But if you were to ask Craig what is the, his life and work for, his reply would not be the same as Alan's. Craig's answer would honestly be, I'm living to do this for the glory of God. I'm living to do this for the glory of God. And some of us here think, oh, that's very holy. 
or pietistic. But this is what I've been gifted for, Craig will tell you. This is my skills, this is my life to live for the glory of God. And you see, this is the difference that separates a follower from God from one that doesn't know him yet. The glory of God, that motivation to see and do and everything to honor and glorify God. It is the distinctively Christian trait, the perspective of a Christian to do it for the glory of God. And so as Mark was mentioning, well done Mark, shorter catechism, probably the best known little uh, question and answer, isn't it? What is the chief end of men and women? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. If you're a Presbyterian or no background, you know this one, don't you? What is the chief end? It is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Simple, easy. That is our reason for being, our reason for existence, the reason you were made. This glorifying and enjoying God is to be our motivation, our desire, our purpose, our ambition in all and every part of our life that we would glorify him and enjoy him forever. So what's the problem? What's the difficulty with that? The problem for you and I in our natural state, our default inclination is not to glorify God or enjoy him forever. Our primary motivation, desire, focus, is to bring glory to ourselves, to honor ourselves, to enjoy me, myself, and I. And when it's not on ourselves, it'll be placed on other things or other people. That motivation, that desire, will be diverted to those other things or an organization, perhaps, an institution, a club, a place, a group, where we will seek to glorify these things and enjoy them forever. And I want tonight to kind of illustrate this um, in a very particular video that we're going to show. Um, and I just want to caveat it before we start. Some of you are going to hate this video. Others will just have to soak it up um, with this. But I want you to notice four thing, a couple of things. If we could hold off, that would be great. Um, I want you to notice, if you can, because I'm going to ask you in a minute, um, I've picked out four, hopefully we'll get more, but just some, as you watch this video, watch out for the major parallels in this video with the scene that we had just read to us from Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. So don't watch it and go, ha ha, that was lovely. Think about it, think about it for a moment and see can you spot some parallels between Revelation 4 and 5 and the video we're about to see. It's only a minute or two. If we were the BBC, we'd be going, there are other companies, all right, uh, with that. Somebody, somebody, hands up if you can see some parallels between that video that you've just watched, um, advertising different generations of jerseys particularly. But any, anyone want to put up a hand? Let's, let's, let's have a bit of participation. Yeah, Clifford. They did not have angelic voices. <laughs> okay, that's, that's subjective, Clifford. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Anyone else? Revelation 4 and 5, and what you saw in the video. Any parallels, anything that stood out for you? Uh, uh, what's that? Yeah, it, it increased. Well, well done, yeah. Um, yes, Mr. Gordon. Okay, yeah, the glory, numbers. Okay, anything else that people spotted? Yeah, Sheila? Diversity. Yeah, they weren't all white English, were they? No, no, they weren't. What do you read in Revelation? Different, different tribes, different nations. Okay, and that, that's one of the big ones, isn't it? A large, diverse crowd, different colors, different tribes and nations, but together. Okay, anything else if you want to spot Mark? Songs they were singing throughout the generations. Yeah, there's a song that has held them together. Okay, and, and if I pull that back, that's great, Mark. They're part of something bigger, aren't they? The song is all one. What keeps them together? Manchester United. Doesn't matter whether you're from Asia or England, they're all together. So they're, they're part of something bigger. Are they enjoying it? Yeah, they love it. <laughs> and then to come back uh, to Mr. Gordon, is, who are they glorifying? It is Man United, isn't it? And there are so many parallels in the story that you think, where, where did they get that from? <laughs> did Man United come up with a packaging? Not really. 
because what is very clever about this video is that it is showing Man United to be enjoyed, to be glorified by a diverse group of people down through time and history. Did you notice that as well? It's not just today with Chevrolet. It was years upon history. And what the video is doing is borrowing or even robbing from the Christian story. It is taking its lines, as it were, from God's story found within the Bible, particularly what you had in Revelation 4, a great diversity of people joined together in part of something bigger than themselves, enjoying it and glorifying and, and, and enjoying that forever. <laughs> and ultimately, if you buy into it, it's a distortion of what you were made for. You and I were not made to ultimately glorify Man United, but in fact, you were designed to what? To enjoy and glorify God forever. And this is the point. The point being made is this, is that when we don't enjoy and glorify God forever, we will look to something else to fill that gap for what we were created for. And our sin and our rebellion against God, we become lovers of self or lovers of other things. And that becomes a thing we glorify and enjoy. But the bigger question, I suppose, to ask is this, is why should we enjoy and glorify God? <clears throat> what is it about him that should make us to enjoy and glorify him forever? And that is the biggest question that you can ask. What is it about God that we should make him our glory, our chief end in life? In order to see why, we need again to see who God is. And as James Montgomery Boyce, in, in a very challenging statement, says this, he said, no people ever rise higher than their idea of God. Conversely, the loss of the, of the sense of God's high and awesome character always leads to the loss of a people's highest ideals, moral values, and even what we commonly call humanity, not to mention the loss of the understanding of an appreciation of the most essential Bible doctrines. We're not going to rise to the ideals of God, but if we lose it, it's detrimental. And the great thing about tonight is that we have in God's revealed word in chapters 4 and 5, that picture of God that is so high, and what a wonderful thing it would be to grasp and understand something of God's nature and character from it that would lead us to worship him and desire his glory alone. And so tonight from Revelation chapter 4 and 5, I want to draw out three main headings that I hope will help us to see who God is and move us to glorify and enjoy him both now and forever. And the first is this, is God rules for his glory alone in chapter 4 verses 1 to 10. The opening verses of chapter 4 find John exposed to a vision. See it there in verse 1? After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open into heaven. And John hears a voice. It's all about seeing and hearing in these chapters. And it says to him, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So John is given this vision of a door opening into heaven, and verse 2 gives us more of what he saw. And he sees is the central piece of the vision when it says, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. You see, what John is seeing in these verses is a vision of God himself seated on his throne. And we know, don't we, when the queen sits on her throne, she rules. It's a symbol of her authority, her power, her right to rule, and it's no different here in the vision of God in chapter 4 of Revelation that we're given language, symbols, sounds, and words in this vision so that we get the picture, the idea of what it means for God to rule. And it's just not just a New Testament thing. The Old Testament has many places where it speaks of God ruling from his throne in heaven. Just let me read two Psalms for you. Psalm 11 verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. He's, his eyes see, his eyelids test the children of men. In Psalm 103, verse 19, we read, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and, the, and the, his kingdom rules over all. 
And yet, Revelation 4 gives us more detail about the image of God ruling when we see in verse 3 that the appearance of God is like jasper and carnelia, precious stones. A rainbow circumvents the throne, and around the throne are 24 other seats of the elders who are clothed in garments of white and golden crowns on their head. God's heavenly throne is the centerpiece. It's a majestic picture, one of grandeur, one of awe, and yet there's a cautiousness with it built into it, which makes the reader, like you and I, not altogether at ease with the throne and the ruling of God, because out from God's throne, verse 5, flashes of lightning, rumbles of thunder going out from the throne. This is the image and sounding from God's throne, and it's more or less sending out a warning. Take note of who you are dealing with. And furthermore, in verse 5, we see, do you see it? Alongside the seat of throne are seven spirits of God before the throne, a sea of glass as clear as crystal. This picture creates a picture, an image of God dwelling on His throne, powerful, yet to be feared. But there's more on each side of the throne as four living creatures one like a lion, another like an ox, one that's like the face of a man, and the fourth is like that of an eagle. They are often taught to be cherubim, winged creatures with eyes all around. And again, these living creatures are around the throne of God. And if you take time at some point over this coming week to check out Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10, you get a similar picture of this vision of the throne And Ezekiel's vision of the throne of God and the glory of God had it connected with these four living creatures too. And here we see in Revelation chapter 4 verse 8 that we're told that these living creatures, day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They sing words of praise to God. They honor God. They bring him glory because he is the ruling one who sits on his throne And yet there's more, because when the living creatures worship God, the 24 elders also fall down before him, casting their crowns to him, who is seated on the throne, and they sing in verse 11, do you see it? You're worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. William Hendrickson in his commentary says this about these chapters. They describe the entire universe from the aspect of heaven. The purpose is, of this vision is to show us in beautiful symbolism that all things are governed by the Lord on the throne. The 24 elders know this. The living creatures are aware of it, and their response is to worship, to glorify God, because they know that God rules, and He rules for His glory alone. God rules for His glory alone. Do you need to be reminded of that this evening? That despite your difficult situation that you find yourself in, your life at this moment in time, God rules and he does it for his glory alone. We've been praying in our prayers and even last week, our world is broken, it's corrupt, it's decaying. Yet we cling on to the truth that God rules for his glory alone. And so we bring him glory That is why we can look to Isaiah 66, which says this, Thus the Lord saith, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Or maybe in two weeks' time, we'll look at Psalm 2, where it says, The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. It is that idea of him ruling for his glory. And tonight, Christians, we can be encouraged by Revelation 4 that our God reigns. Remind yourself of his rule in his word, and he does it for his glory. He is even working that out in the circumstances of the UK's political system. He's working it out in the minutia of your life at this moment in time. He is ruling, and he'll do it for his own glory. That's the first heading tonight. The second one is this, and more briefly, that God creates for his glory. Do you see it in chapter 4, verse 11? I don't know if you've been watching any of the Spring Watch uh, program. Hands up if you, if you know what I'm talking about. Great. 
what a, what a program. Um, I watched it with the kids uh, the other night, and I, I was slightly regretting it when, when a mole was captured by some birds of prey, and the, our little one said, what, what's that, Daddy? And I said, it's dead, <laughs> and it's been fed on something else. But if you've been watching it, it's the annual BBC television series on BBC Two, which gives insights into different British animals, birds, and insects. And in 2005, and even I think recently, it showed some birds of prey that were majestically going into the water, grabbing fish, and then being able to pull that fish up out of the water because its wingspan had power and agility not to get caught in the water, but to be able to rise above it. And there was one moment where he caught such a big fish that it was a battle whether he was going to go down or up. And in, the, in all of that, I, it made me think from a Christian perspective, isn't God something else? Isn't he something else to design wingspan and power in some of these birds and allows for such a variety of them and other animals too? And you're just left with this wonderment and acknowledgement of God as creator. And that's what you find in Revelation 4.11 because the worshiping elders say of God that yes, he is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things, verse 11, and by your will you were, they were created and have their being. God creates for his glory alone. It's important to understand that God didn't need to create anything. It wasn't that he was lonely or isolated and thought I need a few friends, I need some things. He creates for his glory. The existence and the fellowship within the Godhead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit didn't lack for anything. But God created all things, willed them into existence, and created everything for his glory. Humanity, people like you and I are created beings, willed into the existence by God, kept by God. For what reasons? So that you would glorify him and enjoy him forever. I find this deeply humbling, that I am not my own creator. Someone willed me into existence, not just parents, but God himself. I find this doctrine of God deeply humbling, that my existence and my continued existence is not down to whether I will eat well, exercise and sleep, even though they're good. I find this deeply challenging, that our lives, my life is not about my own success or fulfillment or happiness, but I'm created to enjoy God and glorify him forever. Is that how you see your life tonight? Is your very existence, your very being to glorify and enjoy God forever? The sad reality is when we live our lives in rebellion and apathy to God, if we deny God as our creator, then we're not living for what we were created for. And this has been the pattern since Adam and Eve, where we're created for purpose of glorifying and enjoying him forever, but we, we've walked away from that. They wanted their own glory for themselves and no longer enjoyed God, but hid from him. The Bible's right, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul Gardner says this, part of our fallenness and sin is that we find ourselves so often falling short of living for God's glory. And this is each of our predicaments. We don't glorify God, let alone enjoy him. And yet deep down, we know that something is amiss because we're not doing what we were created for. And the question tonight is, is there any way out of that? Is there any hope of change? The good news for us tonight and the good news for your neighbor next door and those in school that you'll meet tomorrow or the work colleague the good news is this, and thirdly and finally, our, our third heading, God rescues for his glory. Revelation chapter 5. Have a look at verse 1. It says this, John had this vision of an unopened scroll in the hand of God who is seated on the throne. The scroll has writing on it, and it is sealed with seven seals. Hendrickson again explains the meaning behind the closed seals when he says this. They symbolize God's purpose with respect to the entire universe throughout history and concerning all creatures in all ages and to all eternity. A closed scroll indicates the plan of God unrevealed and unexecuted. To open that scroll by breaking the seals, not merely to reveal, but to carry out God's plan. And the question of verse two, who is worthy to break and open the seal? 
Who's worthy to carry out the plans and purposes of God, which will impact on the entire universe and its people? And look at the answer to this question in verse 3. No one was able to open it or look into it. So God's redemptive purposes, his plans, no one could exercise. No one could bring about God's judgment and justice. And this news for John, verse 4, causes him to weep and cry loudly in verse 4. It's devastating. No one can come and bring about God's purposes and plans. But then an elder pops up, doesn't he? And he says in verse 5, do you see it? Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Amen to that. You see, all these titles are Old Testament ones, references, and they're referring to the one person who can do the will and purpose of God. It's as if the lens of the camera sweeps back in, in verse 6, to the throne of God again. And there we see a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes. And this lamb goes and takes the scroll. And because of the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall down before God. But the lamb who is Jesus Christ, and they sing this song in verses 9 to 10. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you are slain. And with your blood, you purchased people for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, you've made them to be a kingdom, a priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And it doesn't stop there. And this praise goes further. Do you see it as thousands upon thousands of angels join in the song of verse 11? Perhaps they're the same angels that heralded in the birth of Jesus to those shepherds on the hillside. But now these multiple angels in verse 12 are saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Praise, praise. And then verse 13, there's more. All creation joins in in verse 13. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Gardner again sums up these verses well when he says this. Just as God the creator is worthy to receive praise and glory for his work of creation, so Jesus is worthy to receive praise for his redeeming work, which will eventually lead to a new creation. God rescues for his glory. What hope, what good news that is for us here tonight, that God rescues people like you and I from every tribe and language and nation. And he does it through the death of his son, Jesus, the slain lamb of God, because God rescues for his glory through Christ alone. God does all this to demonstrate his grace towards us, where we receive mercy and forgiveness, newness of life and blessing, not because we deserve it or have earned it for ourselves, because it is grace alone. We receive a true faith that he helps us to respond to him when we are dead in our sins. And the only response of God's people who've been ransomed by Jesus' death, is that they glorify God and enjoy him forever. So tonight, God rules for his glory. God creates for his glory. And God rescues for his glory. And in trying to apply these tonight, I feel the weight of God's word as it spells out to me and hopefully to you that my view of God is too small. We need to recapture the magnitude, the greatness, and holiness of God, again, as ruler, creator, and rescuer. I'm with Michael Horton when he says this, that we must become intoxicated with the majesty of God. James Montgomery Boyce said this, many people are looking for and praying for a reformation in our day, but the only way it will ever come is if true believers rediscover God and seek his glory. As a church, is that our deepest seated desire, 
that our programs will glorify God, that our ministries will glorify Him, our conversations, our lives, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ is seen and redirected by the church. Is there a need for repentance amongst us tonight of self-centered pride, of seeking success with programs, church activities that are emptied of God's seeking glory? Do we, you and I, need to repent of our own seeking self-fulfillment, pleasing others, seeking our own glory above the God who rules, who creates, who rescues for his glory alone? Johann Sebastian Bach used to sign the bottom of his music sheets with the initials S-D-G on some of his work. Soli Dia Gloria, the glory of God. And tomorrow, as you close that business deal, as you mind the kids, as you study, as you spend your money, will you sign your life, your doing, your very existence, existence with SDG for the glory of God alone because he deserves it he creates he rules he rescues you for the glory of God for his glory tonight we end our series on the solas of the reformation faith and we have seen over these last few weeks that scripture alone is our rule for life and practice not our feelings our intellect but his word revealed to us that it is by grace alone, undeserved, given to you as a gift from God, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we are saved and rescued. If these are not where we stand, then they will not ultimately point to the glory of God alone. They will be redirected somewhere else. So may the Lord help us to understand, to live out, to cherish and enjoy these truths, but also defend them for our own lives, for our corporate life together, so that we and others will glory in God alone for who he is and what he has done for us. Let me pray as we continue. Father, we thank you for these last five weeks in which we've been able to look at these truths and these scriptures. And Father, we pray tonight and thank you so much for revealing yourself to us. Thank you, Lord, for your earning of such a great rescue through your son, that, Lord, it isn't our works or how we respond, but that you've, Lord, taken people who have been dead in their sin. You have made them alive in Christ. You have shown us your grace. You have rescued us through Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, tonight that you'll help us to grapple with what it means to bring glory alone to you. Father, you're the God who creates. You're the God who rules. And you're the God who rescues. And so, Father, as we head out into this week, we pray that you'll help us to bring glory and honor to your name. To constantly remind ourselves and others of all that you are and all that you've done. For your glory and honor, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. As you go out into this week uh, to seek to glorify God and enjoy him forever, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen.